I guess I can do the introductions first. Um, uh, my name's Andy Tepper, and I'm co-chair of the International Committee here at the Brooklyn Book Festival. And it's a real, real pleasure to have these three writers here. We've come from far, and they're three writers, amazing writers that I really, really care a lot about, about their books. And um, let me say that the, uh, what do I have to say? Oh, their books are for sale outside, I think you know, at the Green Light Book Stand, and they'll be doing a signing afterwards there. Um, short introduction of each writer. Uh, Guadalupe Nettel is one of the most talked about writers of New Mexican fiction. Uh, her first book to appear in English was Natural Histories. Uh, it was called Five Flawless Stories by the New York Times. Um, she lives in Mexico City, and her latest book is The Body Where I Was Born. And Alejandro Zambra is the great Chilean novelist and poet, and uh, he's the author of four novels, uh, Ways of Going Home, The Private Lives of Trees, Bonsai, uh, and, uh, and the latest one, uh, My Documents, A Book of Stories. And uh, Gior Georgi, and help me with the last name again, Gospodinov. Gospodinov. Godinov, yes, is a Bulgarian poet, writer, and playwright. Uh, his natural novel uh, was published in 23 language, languages in English. Uh, Dalke um, Archive Press published it 10 years ago, and um, I, I was able to do a short review of it, and I was, absolutely loved it. And uh, his new novel is called The Physics of Sorrow, published by Open Letter Press. Uh, was a finalist for four international prizes in Italy, Germany, uh, and uh, he's done a play as well called The Apocalypse, the Apocalypse Comes at 6 p.m. So what we wanted to do is uh, we had this idea of the global 70s. I mean, in New York and in America, we have such a fascination with that decade of the 70s, uh, the feel of it, the look of it, the, uh, the culture, the music. Um, the morals, the extension of the 60s into the 70s, but I thought it'd be interesting uh, to look at that decade elsewhere in, in other parts of the world. What were the different social contexts of it there, and how did that, and how does it inform these three books? I mean, these books of uh, childhood and adolescence that, that span the 70s and into the 80s. So, um, and, it, and also as a way to talk about other larger themes of memory, of uh, fiction writing, and uh, uh, ideas of childhood and, and, and adolescence and how do you write about it and, and mixing different genres. <laughs> so, so that was the idea. We'll start with the 70s as a glimpse into these books and then we'll just open it up and expand from there and move into the 80s. But um, we thought we'd start with reading, short reading, so you can get a sense of the three books and the authors. And then I'll ask questions to each of them and then general questions and we can all have a conversation. So, uh, shall we start, Alejandro? Do you, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> good morning. No, good afternoon. <laughs> good morning. No. Thank you for this invitation. I will read some excerpts um, from Ways of Going Home and then um, the beginning of my document. Once I got lost, I was six or seven, I got distracted and all of a sudden I couldn't see my parents anymore. I was scared, but I immediately found a way home and got there before they did. They kept looking for me, desperate, but I thought that they were lost, that I knew how to get home and they didn't. This morning, I saw a woman reading on a bench on Intercommunal Park. I sat down across from her just to get a look at her face, but it was impossible. The book absorbed her gaze completely, and there were a few moments I believed she was aware of it, that holding the book like that at the exact height of her eyes with both hands, her elbows resting on an imaginary table, 
was her way of hiding. I saw her white forehead and her almost blonde hair, but never her eyes. The book was her disguise, a precious mask. Her long fingers held up the book like strong, slender branches. I got close enough at one point to see that her nails were racked, as if she had been chewing them. I'm sure she sensed my presence, but she didn't lower the book. She held it as if she were meeting someone else's gaze. To read is to cover one's face, I thought. To read is to cover one's face, and to write is to show it. ¿Se entiende algo? Estoy leyendo mal. Bien. Sorry. From my documents. The first time I saw a computer was in 1980, when I was four or five years old. It's not a pure memory, though. I'm probably mixing it up with other later visits to my father's office on Calle Agustinas. I remember my father explaining how those enormous machines worked, his black eyes fixed on mine, his perpetual cigarette in hand. He waited for my odd reaction, and I faked interest, but as soon as I could, I went off to play near Loredo, a thin-lipped secretary with bangs framing her face who never remembered my name. Loreto's electric typewriter struck me as marvelous, its small screen where the words accumulated until a powerful salvo carved them into the paper. It was a device that was perhaps similar to a computer, but I never thought of it that way. In any case, I prefer the other machine at her desk, a conventional black Olivetti, a model I was very familiar with because we had one just like it at my house. My mother had studied programming, but she'd abandoned computers and opted instead for that lesser technology, which was still current then, since the proliferation of computers was still a ways off. My mother didn't get paid for any of her typing work. She, the, the text she transcribed were songs, stories, and poems written by my grandmother, who was always entering some contest or working on a project that would she thought, finally pull her out of anonymity and into the spotlight. I remember my mother working at the dining room table, carefully inserting the carbon paper, painstakingly applying white out when she made a mistake. She always typed very quickly, using all of her fingers without looking at the keyboard. Maybe I can say it like this. My father was a computer, and my mother was a typewriter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have to say, Alejandro, that last line of that story is one of my favorites, where you say, you repeat that, and you say, my father was a computer, and my mother was a typewriter. I was a blank page, and now I am a book. It's a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful ending. Um, Guadalupe, would you, would you like to? Yeah. Read from, are you going to read from the stories? Well, from a little bit from the stories yeah. and a little bit from the model. Well, hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, what I'm going to read now is um, the beginning of a story called Fungus, which belongs to this collection. When I was a little girl, my mother had a fungus on her toenail on her left pinky toe, to be exact. From the moment she discovered it, she tried everything to get rid of it. Every morning, she'd step out of the shower and with the help of a tiny brush, pour over her toe a cup of iodine, whose smell and sepia, almost reddish tone, I remember well. She saw to no avail several dermatologists including the most prestigious and expensive in the city, who repeated the same diagnosis and suggested the same futile treatments. 
from traditional trimesal ointments to apple cider vinegar. The most radical among them even prescribed her a moderate dose of cortisone, which only inflamed my mother's yellow toe. Despite her efforts to banish it, the fungus remained there for years until a Chinese doctor to whom nobody, even my mother, gave credit, great, gave credit, was able to dive it away in a few days. It happened so unexpectedly that I could not help wondering if the parasite itself hadn't decided to move on to another place. Until that moment, fungi had always been, at least for me, curious mushrooms that appear in children's books, illustrations, and that I associated with the forest and elves. In any case, nothing to do with that rugosity that gave my mother toenail the texture of an oyster shell. However, more than the dubious and shifting appearance, more than its tenacity and attachment to the invaded toe, what I remember most about the whole affair was the disgust and repulsion the parasite inspired in my mother. I have seen other people over the years with mycosis on different parts of their body, all kinds of mycosis, from those that cause the bottom of the foot to dry out and peel to the circular red fungi you often see on chef's hands. Most people bear them with resignation, some with stoicism, others with genuine disregard. My mother, on the other hand, had suffered the presence of her fungus as if it were a mortifying affliction. Terrified by the thought that it might spread to the rest of her foot, or worse, her entire body, she, spread, she separated the affected toe nail with a thick piece of cotton to keep it from rubbing against the adjacent toe. She never wore sandals and avoided taking off her socks in front of anyone she wasn't very close to. If for some reason she had to use a public shower, she always wore plastic slippers, and to swim in a pool, she take off her shoes right at the edge just before diving in, so that nobody would see her feet, and so much the better if anyone had found out about the toe and all the treatments it had been through, they would have thought that instead of a simple fungus, what my mother had was the beginning of leprosy. Children, unlike adults, adapt to everything. So little by little, despite my mother's disgust, I began to see that fungus as an everyday presence in my family life. It didn't inspire the same aversion in me as it did in my mother, just the opposite. I felt a protective sympathy for the iodine-painted toenail, which seemed vulnerable to me, similar to what I would have felt for a crippled pet that had trouble moving around. Time went on, and my mother stopped making such a fuss over her affliction. For my part, I grew up and completely forgot about it, and never again thought about fungi until I met Philippe Laval. Thank you, Guadalupe. <laughs> and uh, Georgi, I, I was just going to announce, I was supposed to announce that uh, you'll be part of this literary ping pong match. Uh, anyway, I was asked to announce it at 6.30 tonight. Uh, the, they're having a literary ping pong match of the decade at St. Francis College. Team New York Public Library against Team uh, Brooklyn Book Festival. Anyway, it, go, it goes along with the 70s theme a little bit. Thank you. So. There is no God in Bulgaria, Grandma. I blurted it out as soon as we got home, and I caught sight of her pouring oil into the icon lamp on the wall. My grandmother crossed herself quickly and invisibly. She surely would be snapped at me for such talk, but she saw my father in the doorway and merely said, well, what is there in Bulgaria anyway? There is no paprika, no oil. Only she could combine the country's physical and metaphysical deficit like that. God, oil, and paprika. 
She would read the Bible furtively. She had wrapped it in a newspaper so it wouldn't show. She would read at random, dragging her index finger along the lines and moving her lips. Thus, I heard the whole apocalypse in whispers in the late afternoons of my childhood under the quiet, Yericho trumpets of the flies buzzing around the room. Catalog of collections. Napkins, empty packs of cigarettes, matchboxes, pins and stamps, pocket calendars, winking postcards, wrappers from imported candies, paper and tinfoil, wrappers from chocolate bars, paper and tinfoil, gum wrappers, minus the gum, empty bottles of whiskey, cognac, campari. Clearly, the things in this collection are abandoned, empty, used up. Somebody has smoked Marlboro Reds and Rotman's Blues, eaten imported chocolate candies, chewed some gums, and downed a Metaxa brandy, brandy. Only a few bottles, boxes, and wrappers are left for us, the collectors of emptiness and abandonment. Okay. On the one hand, there was the apocalypse, the flood, the end of the world, according to John and my grandmother. On the other hand, that Tutti and armed to the teeth Jimmy Carter was lurking with his cowboy hat riding a Pershing missile as he was drawn in my father's newspaper. The two apocalypses, his grandmother's and the school's official one, didn't coincide precisely, which only made matters worse. So, there wouldn't be any surprises he practiced for both scenarios. Whatever happens, put on your gas mask and start praying. During one of the drills, he tried to say a prayer with his gas masks on his head, but only a quiet rumbling could be heard through the holes while the ice pieces of the tight rubber mask fogged up. What are you bubbling to yourself about, Greenhorn? His military training teacher barked at him. He was a major. When you prattle on, you only use up your oxygen more quickly. And the last lines in this book, because there are many time capsules, I had also the TV listing for Monday, November 18, 1973. So some lines of this TV program. 5.30, discussion on decisions made by the July plenum of the Central Committee of the Bulgarian Communist Party. 6 p.m. News, 6.10, for pioneers, the little drum, 6.30, children and circus, 7, beautiful and comfortable, a program about economics, 7.20, for the people's army, an attention with a song, mm -hmm. concert, and 7.45, melody of the mouth, 7.50, good night, children. I can't explain why, but this listing always plunged me into melancholy. The last news at 10 p.m., and that's it. Only <laughs> and snowflakes after the national anthem. Thank you, Georgi. Well, I'll, I'll start with Georgi. Um, I mean, your book, uh, it's, it's made up of vignettes, and it, and it travels in time. There's a lot of time travel from the Ice Age all the way to the Cold War. But to just focus on the uh, 70s, I mean, it's probably the most different from what we're used to. T tell me what the socialist 70s looked like in Bulgaria. What, what, I mean, there is this melancholy. First, you describe children who are, spend the summers with their grandmothers uh, in the countryside, a feeling of abandonment, which is a key theme. But there's a fear of the apocalypse, of nuclear war. I mean, and it's comic as well. But um, Tell, it, tell, me, tell us more about the time capsules in the 70s. Yeah, my time capsule in <laughs> the 70s, yes. Uh, it looks like long, lazy afternoon. <laughs> it, it's, it's my image about 70s uh -huh, in uh -huh. Bulgaria. Uh -huh. And 
even I think that the 70s are the afternoon of the century in some yeah. way. Uh -huh. uh, so, from other hand, but nothing happened. <laughs> it, was, it was my childhood time. Yeah. It was, uh, I had uh, two big fears, and my generation in yeah. this time had uh, two big fears. One was by the, the apocalypse, the neutron bomb, uh, and uh, the other one was, I could say, we had a feel of abandonment. Or, or maybe it's just my, my, my feeling of That's abandonment. That's a Bulgarian? In Bulgarian, sensation, yeah. yeah. Because we are living in the uh, ground floors, basement, yeah, not base. basement, but uh, yeah. or underground, underground floors, yeah. on, uh, with the windows on the mm -hmm. sidewalk level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, my 70s was like that. I'm sitting mm -hmm. on this window mm -hmm. and uh, watching passing uh, cats and feeds, cats and feeds. And I could imagine the people, uh, uh, on these feet, I could building the mm -hmm. people on these feet, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, uh, because our, of course, our parents were, they, they worked really hardly, mm -hmm. and we stay alone at right, home right. The, the whole day, or we just lived with our grandparents. Uh, yeah, it, it was my my image, the long and the afternoon. news, afternoon. Yeah, and news from the rest of the world. Were you? Uh, of course, it, it's another trouble, you know. Uh, it was forbidden to travel abroad right, during right. the 70s. And it, for me, it's a big trauma. You would mm -hmm. think that it's a, nothing, okay. But it's a big trauma because, um, you know, uh, I, I, I told that abroad yeah. was a different country, separate country, like, I don't know, Italy or, or yeah. France. And when my, my brother told me, do you know that abroad mm -hmm. doesn't exist? I said, no. <laughs> They have such a big chew gum, they have a chocolate bar, they have everything, they have Beatles. Uh, so it, it was really, we, we lived really, not to say close, yeah. with, with my grandfather uh, lost his, uh, what to say, left, left, left his village only once. Could you suggest when? During the Second World War. So this was the, the time that he saw many countries. Yeah. Or two countries, Hungary and uh, Serbia. But for him, it was the whole world. My my parents, they never lived uh, Bulgaria. So when I travel now, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking that I'm I'm watching the world uh, through their eyes. Their eyes. Their yeah. eyes yeah. Uh, it, it's a, it's a really trauma. Uh, you know, Montaigne had a great phrase: "I don't want to travel to India, but." Uh, if you forbidden me to travel to India, I will be most unhappy person. <laughs> Guadalupe, I wanted to talk to you about Mexico in, in your book. I mean, perhaps it's the, more familiar to, a, to American uh, readers because you have a milieu, uh, a kind of a bohemian uh, culture, uh, this, this, the whole rev sexual revolution, open, uh, you know, open marriage, uh, there's a commune, this kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, um, and yet it's different. I mean, there's also, uh, in your community in Mexico City, the building um, complex, there's a, a lot of emigres, exiles from Latin America. And you mentioned, you know, this is the 70s, this decade of dictatorships around, and, and there's some stories we can get to that actually involve Alejandro of, <laughs> of, uh, of a character. Yeah, Alejandro appears at a certain moment of this novel. Yeah. <laughs> A Chilean mm -hmm. uh, girl, a family that's living in, in your in your uh, building, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, the 70s was a very interesting decade in Mexico because we were like very close to this. Um, a part of the of the um, society was very influenced by all this hippie revolution. So my generation are is we are the first. Uh, children from the hippie generation, so we were in a sense guinea pigs because they were they they had like ideas like <laughs> changing the families, <clears throat> changing the family ties, the relationship between the couple, the relationship with between the society. So in my school we had kids, many different kids with funny names that 
are not oh, yeah, that yeah. weren't used before and they are not used afterwards, like Khrushchevna or Lenin, many of them, and also Kundalini or even <laughs> even clitoris. Yeah. There were there was a girl called clitoris. <laughs> so yeah, so and and that spoke about what was happening on their parents' minds actually. So I remember that I went to, to one of my friend's um, classmates, or one of my classmates, and the, the parents used to make love in front of the children as nothing was going on, you know. So we grew up in this kind of lab environment, and now we speak about all this, this decade from, you know, the distance and and when I started reading this, uh, writing this book, I just became a mother. I, I was, my first son had one month since he was birthed. So I compared a lot the circumstances in which I was born and raised and the circumstances in which he was born and raised, uh, was going to be raised. And also, yeah, what you were saying about the whole exile Mexico was very... I, I'll just add one thing, though. We should point out that the, the book, the structure of it, is being told to a therapist. Yeah. So, I mean, she's dealing with a... Yeah, <laughs> yeah make, making questions, you know, that have no answer, the therapist doesn't answer. But it's like questions I would like to ask to a therapist. And in a sense, for me, the reader is a therapist, you know? It's like, it, I, I prefer to leave all these questions without an answer because they have no answer for me. So I wouldn't accept one right. single. What is the damage? What is? Yeah. What? Do, how? How can we go grow up yeah. like that and so? On. Go ahead. Yeah, you were saying about, about the exile. Yeah. So in Mexico, we didn't have dictatorships or ships or not in a very right. um, straight or open way. Um, Vargas Llosa used to say that Mexican was the perfect dictatorship actually, <laughs> because nobody noticed it. But it was, and it still is. And we have more people killed now in the recent six days than uh, six years than all the people killed during the dictatorships in in all South America. Few people know that, but it's true. But we <clears throat> received many people, many left-wing people that came persecuted from their countries and live in my neighborhood. So I lived with children that had both parents disappear or, were, or, or one parent killed. And there was a girl who was my neighbor, and I um, admire her a lot. And when I went and traveled to, she, she committed suicide when she was very little, I mean like 15 years old. And when I traveled to Santiago just for three days, it happened that I crossed, uh, I came across her family by, you know, like, um, Azar, you call, call, you call that? Like, yeah, but, but, yeah, like, or, like, yeah. So, and Alejandro was there. <laughs> so I tell that part of the book. Yeah, you have a line in the book about, <coughs> um, you know, how people had honorably survived, the sense of surviving the 70s and coping. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Alejandro, I was going to ask you, I mean, you have a section in Ways of Going Home called mm -hmm. We're All Right, The Kids Are All Right. And, and you, of course, the, your children and your books are growing up through the 70s, the period of Pinochet. But, but um, tell me how you, how you deal with um, writing about a, a period like that. I mean, you, the politics are in the background and the characters are in the front end, but there's certain signposts of uh, events where Pinochet appears. Yeah, because I, I, I was born in 1975. Right, you're so a bit younger. I was born yeah. two yeah. years uh, after the dictatorship began. And um, actually, I don't have anything to say about the, the, the 70s, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I grew up during the 80s in, in Chile. And I don't know, um, you you... Most of past childs were in, protected in, in some way, you know? but a way of uh, protecting us was uh, 
uh, hiding us the truth. So you, you as a child, you, you, you know, um, or you begin to know terrible things were happening, but uh, uh, they, it was, uh, you, you, were, you, you were not supposed to talk about it. Your parents didn't talk about it. Um, you you live in a in a in a neighborhood where nobody speaks to to the other. You know this this confusion, uh, or this limit that is so difficult to 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 understand between silence and be being silenced. You know, and I think that that was uh, uh, mostly. And and then when when I was uh, I don't know 14, 15 years old. Um, you you ask your parents for an answer and you get angry with them um, and it is um, hard to handle because well I think we grew up with the sensation that history was happen was something that happened to our parents yeah. you know because uh, um, they suffer they fought or they didn't fall, so they didn't fight. Um, and, you know, parents always say, say these things to child. You cannot uh, have an opinion. You were not there. You were not there. Uh, uh, you were not born when this happened, so you, you, don't, you don't have to say. And I think that was a very um, difficult to us because we we knew we were not the main characters. Yeah. But uh, this is a mixed sensation because if you are not supposed to be the, the protagonist, uh, this is bad and at the same time it is comfortable because you don't have to do anything. So I think this is the problem we faced uh, during the 90s, you know? And you call them the secondary characters. Yeah. They were yeah. secondary characters, yeah. It's a complexity. Um, when I'm talking here in English, uh, uh, I think yeah. I cannot say it properly, but uh, the, 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 the book is about uh, that uh, mixed feeling. It's not like uh, I'm saying, oh, um, they didn't uh, give us the choice to... No, it, in, in a way, we, we, we were guilty to, but um, um, maybe uh, writing is a way of uh, understand things um, trying to, to, to really understand them and you, obviously we, we were not guilty because we were tired uh, but at the same time we belonged to the country and, and, and we, are, we are not innocent at the same time so a, a novel is not trying to propose one thing or the other but um, showing the complexity of, of this, uh, how, to, how, how, how you deal with the past. Uh, Alejandro, there was an interview where, where um, someone said that this, my documents, all this, the stories add up to, to almost a, uh, a portrait of a generation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and the, there's one story in here called The Most Chilean Man. <laughs> Tell me why he was Chilean or how, wh wh what that means. <laughs> and, and does it add up to a portrait? I think you said that, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, yeah, I, I really don't feel know. the burden <laughs> of expressing it. I really don't know, but there is something about, um, you know, about the 90s. This is a different panel, no? Uh, happening. <laughs> <laughs> we can but go to uh, the 90s and then let's go back to yeah, the 80s. But, uh, the, 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 the 90s were, 80s. we were young and yeah. we, we made our own decisions um, during the 90s. I was uh, 15 years old in 1990, you know? um, and uh, I think all the stories of this book are about belonging, some way or another. Belong to a country, belong to a family, belong to a couple, to, to belong to, you know, that was the, the hymn, hymn, it is hymno during yeah. the 90s, Yeah. Uh, this song by oh. Radiohead, Radiohead. Uh, Creep. Uh, we didn't uh, understand the song, but uh, we, we like, liked it a lot, and we were singing and very drunk, you know? And, and, what was and, the and song? that song, uh, uh, Creep, you know that Creep. song? Creep. It, it, it was like uh, everywhere uh, people was uh, singing this song. And, 
and in the end it says, uh, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. <laughs> you know that song. No? So we were drunk, um, <laughs> singing this song, and we didn't understand what it said. But that was our problem. Uh, we, 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 we had the feeling that we, we, we don't belong to anything. To, to, and, and, and at the same time, they want us to feel that. You know? So... Um, that's it. You know, going back to the 70s, we had the, the, the idea in America, there was the me generation. That was the, what it was called. But, um, Jorge, you have this wonderful phrase where you, do, where you say, we am or we was, and it's this plural idea. Um, tell me more about that concept and what you're, what you're saying. Uh, I mean, you're speaking for so many different yeah. viewpoints, perspectives. Yeah, I think it's a key phrase uh, of the novel because it's a novel uh, about the sorrow, of course, because it's the physics of sorrow, but uh, also a novel about empathy. I, I think empathy, that, yeah. uh, empathy is an important thing in the novel. It's about the character, a boy who suffered from uh, extra empathy and could uh, enter into the, the head of his grandfather, father, and say, through the sorrow, through the sorrow. And we, am, or I, are, for me, is the, the key phrase for the empathy. I don't mean just empathy to the other people. It's easier, I think. If you suffer, I will feel empathy to you. Uh, my, my body, I will feel pain in my body. But to feel empathy to, to Minotaur, Tower, because in my interpretation, the Minotaur Tower is a three years old abandoned child. And if you read again the myth, you will see that it's true. And it's a, to feel empathy about the abandoned children, to feel empathy about the ginkgo biloba, snail, uh, and everything, some everything. kind of environmental <laughs> empathy. Uh, as, as Darwin says, uh, the, the animals are our brother in pain, so everything that could feel pain could have this empathy. Uh, and yes, uh, it's a kind of uh, time capsule of stories of my grandparents, my parents, but right. also the right. people uh, that never will tell their stories. You know, when I started the book, there was uh, an article in Economist, and the title was The Saddest Place in the World. <laughs> and you know which is the saddest place in the world? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> <laughs> so we are champions sometimes, <laughs> in, in a sorrow, champions. Uh, but I want to, to, to say something. Yeah, that, yeah absolutely. That said, yeah, uh, I think that in Bulgaria we had, during this time, during my childhood, we had the similar culture of science, yeah. let's say. Uh -huh. And uh, the similar silence between us and our parents. Mm -hmm. Maybe they wanted mm -hmm. to protect us. Mm -hmm. But we knew very early, we knew clearly that what we told in the kitchen should yeah. be stay in the kitchen. Right. And so it's it's not very healthy because you became a schizophrenic. I, in, in the kitchen, I could be very strong. And I could say, oh, this stupid dictatorship or something like this. But when I'm on the street or with, with other people, I should be good pioneer. Mm. And, and this kind of schizophrenia was very typical for, for the 70s in Bulgaria. Mm. Mm. Guadalupe, I wanted to ask you about a phrase called, you, you talk about the tricks of memory, and um, how, how you decided what to include and how you were able to evoke what you could remember from childhood in, in the book. Well, and What you left out, what you took, kept in. That's why I called it a novel and not, yeah. you know, a, a memoir or something, because when you, when you write about your story and about your family story, you have to make choices. So you, what I prefer to focus on was on the main feeling that I had during all my childhood, which was this feeling of inadequacy, of being an outsider, you know? Uh -huh. First because, um, as it says from the first sentence of the novel, I was born with a birthmark which was also a cataract and was also like an eye deformation. 
and it made me blind for half of, half of the day because I have to cover the, the good eye with a patch and live like that the, the during all the, all the morning and part of the afternoon as well. So at school and at many other places, even in my family, I was like someone different, you know? Yeah. Someone we had to take care of in my family uh, that the children may um, bully sometimes or at least being nasty about it. And then how I connected with all these children that felt like that because they were foreigners, because right. they were suffering different circumstances. And then how we have to leave the country at a certain point and going to France, but not the France that everybody imagines, like the Tour Eiffel and so on, but the south of France uh, and the banlieue environment. So this, this is in the 80s, actually, yeah. we can, when we can start talking about moving on. But the family moves, you move with your mother to the south of France. And your father stays back. Yeah. And, and he was in prison, actually. Well, and it was a mystery in the book until, until you do discover yes. that he was in prison, yeah. So since the moment I discovered that my father is in prison, I can't talk about what is really happening in my family. I can't talk, I can't talk about all the dynamics that are inside the family, and I have to lie, you know? Mm -hmm. They show me yeah. to, to tell something different about us. And it was hard, in a way, because I felt more, even more, you know, like outside Estranged, there. Estranged, yeah, outside. Yeah. And also the feeling of, of belonging, as we were saying, of a kind of category in the world, all the outsiders, like an international of outsiders, being them like um, Arabics or, you know, this, all these people around yeah. the French society which don't belong exactly, exactly right. to the French society, but they are like uh, gravitating around or something. Yeah. 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 So this book is mostly about that. Yeah. And that's why I call it a novel, because many things were left out. And as I tell in the book, Maybe, probably my brother would have told the story of the yeah. family in a very different way, or maybe totally opposite to mine, or my mother, you know? And so it's, yeah, it's a little bit risky too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but m moving into the 80s, actually, um, there's an event where you, do, where you do find out that your father's in prison, it's because of the earthquake. There's a 1985 earthquake in Mexico, yeah. which is a, a major event in your work as well, the, the, the earthquake. Yeah, the, the same year we, yeah. we, we had a, an, an earthquake in Chile. That's how I knew uh, Mexico was far away because our earthquake, I'm not saying it with proud, but <laughs> <laughs> our earthquake was in March and the Mexican earthquake was in September. September. 20 so, years ago. Uh, yeah, we we yeah. were watching a lot of Mexican television, so my feeling was that uh, Chile and Mexico were very close, you know, mm -hmm. uh, geographically. <laughs> so I, I, I said to my father, let's go there and, and to help. <laughs> he said, no way, it's like uh, 10 hours in a plane. <laughs> it's very expensive. But, um, um, well... <laughs> no, I'm, it, we're just talking about going into the 80s, and I wanted to... Jorge has a wonderful passage. Uh, I can read it, or you, you, would you like to read about, um, about adolescence in the, in the 80s? And um, he says, In fact, the whole period I was in puberty can br briefly be described through the prism of the complex political context of the 80s. First kiss with a girl, Brezhnev dies. Second kiss, different girl, Chernyenko dies. Third kiss, Andropov dies. Am I killing them? <laughs> First fumbling sex in the park, Chernobyl. <laughs> A long half-life of exponential decay ensues. <laughs> but, but then you also have this great idea of the 80s, the official history of the 80s and the private history of the 80s. <laughs> the, I think the private one is boredom or something, right? <laughs> yeah, I tried to write uh, history of the boredom of the 80s, <laughs> because I think that it was, sorry, because I'm, 
I was born in 1968, so I, I pretend that 60s are my, my decade. That's why I could say that for me, for, for this part of the world, the 80s were the most boring decade. <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> but yeah, and I have this, uh, this uh, time capsules about uh, yeah, and uh, official, official history uh, and yeah. unofficial history of the 80s. Uh, and also about the deficit of the 80s, because our Bildungsroman, our growing up, was really connected with the different kind of deficits. I read to you about the deficit of God. The God was forbidden. Uh, we had a deficit of erotics also. So mm -hmm. I have a, a yeah. small time capsule about the, our Sex. sources of the erotics. <laughs> and one of them, I just will mention it because it was very important for us to read and to have the page 28 of the novel Godfather by Mario Puzo. If you go home now, you could check what, what's written on this page. It was <laughs> our uh, yeah, uh, guide for sexual education. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we bounced around. We started with the 70s. We did the 90s and 80s. Um, thank you all. I, we have a few minutes for questions. So if there's any questions from the audience, and then we'll have the signing outside. Does anybody have any question? For, do we have time for <laughs> any questions? No. no? What is that? I see. I get the message. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Thank the authors, and we'll see you outside. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. It went pretty quickly. Yeah, it went quickly. I couldn't understand what she was saying. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to me, I'm trying to really.